So um, at the time, I was living in Paris. I was just a couple months out of college, and I was working as a paralegal and pursuing this other, you know, stringer position on the side. And I hadn't been feeling well for a while. It started with an itch, and the itch blossomed into all kinds of mysterious symptoms. Mm -hmm. I was getting colds all the time and coming down with bouts of bronchitis. Uh, but the biggest symptom I had was fatigue. Mm. But of course, at 22, everyone is tired. Yeah. Everyone that I was hanging out with was working hard and going out at night dancing. And so I didn't really make much of it. And I went to see a number of doctors, all of whom, you know, treated that specific symptom or ailment right. and sent me home. And toward the end of my time in Paris, I started to get the feeling that my doctors that I was seeing weren't taking me seriously. Mm -hmm. But I think the truth is I wasn't entirely taking myself seriously. Mm -hmm. And it was only when I got to a point where I was so weak, it was a struggle to walk up and down the stairs that I found myself in an emergency room. And within 24 hours, I was on a plane back home to wow. upstate New York and I got the bone marrow biopsy that led to my actual diagnosis. To hear the words that you were diagnosed with a specific type of leukemia at 22 is scary enough, but when they said the chances of survival were one in three, I mean, my God, like yeah. what does a, what goes through a 22 year old's head? I think there was this immediate sense of fracture. There was my life before yeah. and everything that came after. And, you know, I never returned to Paris, to my apartment, to my job. Friends packed up my things and, and mm. sent them to my house. And I had this sense, even though I couldn't quite wrap my head around what it meant to have a cancer diagnosis at 22, that the person I'd been before was buried. There was mm. no returning mm. to that pre-diagnosis self. The cancer fight, and it, I don't know how y you describe it, but it usually there's a beginning and an end point for it. I mean, I had breast cancer, I think for six or eight months, I went through stuff. Yeah. Your timing, the, the three and a half, was it three and a half, four years of going through chemo and bone marrow and chemo again. How did you see light and how mm -hmm. did you survive all those days? One of the most challenging parts of that experience was the sense of the goalposts moving. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, you know, on day one that I was going to be in treatment for three and a half years. And they say you can survive anything as long as you can see the end date yeah. in sight. And there came a point in my treatment where I couldn't see that end in sight. Mm. And that was the most challenging, I think, to know how to kind of anchor yourself when you're swimming in a sea of uncertainty. I mean, there are life lessons that come in your worst times. I mean, some change we, we choose in our life and some is cast upon us and mm. you have to figure it out. And I don't know, I remember so clearly how the world got clear. Like it, I was never clear. I think I was kind of always mushy about things. Mm. Those are my friends. I don't love that one so much, but so what? They're nice. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And then all of a sudden you realize like my life has a beginning and an end and I'm not wasting time. Like that time is over. Yeah. Did you have that sensation? Yeah, I think like, you know, a lot of people in their early 20s, I had this feeling of time. Yes. I had time to figure out who I was, time to figure out what I wanted to do. And that diagnosis brought into immediate, urgent focus the fact that we're all here for a finite mm -hmm. period of time. And I felt a strange sense of urgency around time. Mm -hmm. And I had the same experience. It felt like all the artifice just kind of fell away. Yeah, I got clear not only about who my friends were, but maybe more importantly, who I wanted to be friends with and what mm. kind of relationships I wanted to cultivate. And I had such limited energy that I was well enough to maybe do three things every day, small mm. things like write an email, watch a movie, see a friend. And what that meant for me was that I had to get very clear about my priorities. Wow. 
That is so true. And it, there's something so strange about how free you feel suddenly. You didn't even realize you were carrying all that heavy junk around. Yeah. It's like I didn't even, you know, you don't even realize it. It's like my shoulders feel lighter, even okay. though you're in the middle of it. So to have a doctor say to you after a bone marrow transplant and chemo again, okay, I don't know if you used the term cancer-free or mm -hmm. you are in remission, but to hear those words, what did, what did that moment feel like? Mm. I mean, I had been hoping to hear those words for almost three and a half years. The goal had always been to survive, and I'd spent, you know, 1,400 days working tirelessly oh, toward that goal. And I thought when I got to that place, I would want to celebrate. Yeah. I wanted to feel grateful. I wanted to quickly and organically fold back into the rhythms of living. But instead, I found myself in this kind of limbo, this kind of in-between place where on paper I was better, mm -hmm. but off paper I couldn't have felt further from being the healthy, happy, you know, 27-year-old that I'd hoped to be on the other side of all this. Well, especially because when you spend almost, well, three and a half years in one space, the I, it's the same thing, the idea that, okay, now this is over and all your friends or some of your friends and colleagues are saying, oh, great. So now we can go back to the way it was. Let's go out to the bar. Let's go have some fun. Exactly. You weren't feeling those things. Yeah, I wanted to be you feeling wanted those to, yeah. things. But, you know, I think often when we talk about things like cancer, the kind of final act yeah. or the end of the story is comes with a cure. Uh, but we mm -hmm. don't talk a lot about what happens after. Mm -hmm. And... It took me a, a while to even acknowledge to myself how much I was struggling. There were so many unanswered questions that I didn't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how do I find a job when I need to nap for four hours mm -hmm. in the day or my immune system is still sending me to the emergency room on mm -hmm. a regular basis? How do I date when I have a quarter inch of hair and a port still in my chest? How do I talk about you know, the side effects of chemo, like infertility or early menopause, like all of it felt so overwhelming. And in a weird way, I found myself almost wishing that I was still sick, not because I wanted to have leukemia, of course, but I understood the hospital ecosystem. Right. That was the world right. I lived in for four years. I felt comfortable there. I looked like the other patients. It was the outside world mm -hmm. that felt scary and foreign and daunting to me. So I love your New York Times column. I thought it was so beautiful and riveting and moving. But what I loved so much more was when people reached out to you because they wanted, because they, they connected with you. You had mm -hmm. this way that whether you were sick before or you weren't or you knew, somehow people felt you, like they, you reached across and you grabbed them by the heart. Mm. And people wrote you letters. And, you know, in, in this industry, sometimes you get a letter and you got beautiful letters and you read them, but then you did something totally amazing. Like I have not, <laughs> I have not heard of someone doing this, but what did you do with those letters that you got? So, you know, in that year after I finished treatment, I was in the most lost place yeah. I've ever been. I knew I wasn't a cancer patient anymore. I knew I couldn't return to the person I'd been pre-diagnosis, but I had no idea who I was. And so I started thinking about these different rites of passages that we have in our culture, these kind of ritualized ceremonies that help us move through transitions mm -hmm. like baby showers and mm -hmm. weddings and funerals. And I realized that there wasn't a kind of ritual or rite of passage when you emerge from a long illness. Mm -hmm. And I needed that. I needed time to reckon with what I'd been through and to reflect on yeah. who I wanted to become. I needed the space away from my home and my kind of cancer identity to really kind of come into my own. And so I hatched this kind of boondoggle mm -hmm. of a plan and I decided to learn how to drive. You hadn't. You didn't have your license. I did not point. have my license. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I rented out my apartment yeah. and I borrowed a friend's car and I ended up embarking on a fifteen thousand mile road trip across the country to meet some of the strangers who'd written me letters about their own major life interruptions mm. and their own stories of transition. And 
they really, you know, those individuals or about 22 of them that I visited became my sort of breadcrumb trail through the wilderness of survivorship. Mm. I was always prepared for the other shoe to drop, Ah. prepared for something to go wrong. And what I found instead in these encounters and on that road trip was that the world really welcomed me at Mm. every turn. I ended up, you know, staying on someone's fold out couch. I stayed on a ranch in Wyoming with a family of survivalist ranchers. I visited a high school teacher in California who was grieving the death of her son. I went to uh, a maximum security prison in Texas to visit a death row convict. And each of those conversations helped me gain a sense of perspective Mm. on my own predicament. But more than that, I think it showed me a way to reimagine community and it gave me this sense of connection that at a time in my life when I felt so lost and so isolated really helped me see a path forward. Are you happy? I'm so happy. (laughs) What what makes you happy now? (laughs) The strange thing in the last year of this pandemic is I found myself uh, living a, a version of the life that I had when I was sick, which Mm. is to say that my circle is much smaller, Smaller, my life is quieter. And I don't know about you, but I have spent so much of the last decade striving and working and hustling. And I feel so privileged to get to do work that I love. Mm -hmm. But I've also been thinking about the way that that working at that pace can be its own kind Mm -hmm. of trauma Mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. So this year for me, my goal has been leisure. Uh, which isn't to say I'm not working all the of time, you are. yeah. But you know these small moments that I've gotten to have in the last year of of being at home with our dogs, of gardening, of hanging out with my partner John. Of- you know, it's so interesting because I I sometimes think like life is full of exclamation points. It's like the good ones. You graduated from college, you meet a great guy, you have a baby, you get married. And then on the flip side, it's you get a sad diagnosis, somebody passes away, et cetera. But most of the days Mm -hmm. are just Wednesday in the middle. Nothing terrific and nothing horrible, just Wednesday. Yeah. Something I've been thinking about recently is trying to approach my Wednesday as ritual, Hmm. washing the dishes as ritual, Mm -hmm. gardening as ritual, and really trying to kind of slow down and and savor that because it's so easy to move from one exclamation point to the next. But I'm sure as you know, you know, when you get a scary diagnosis, you're not thinking about the things that are on your resume. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about the people you love Mm -hmm. and wanting to spend time with them you're thinking about the things that nourish you Mm -hmm. and yeah all the rest doesn't matter as much and it falls away you know we live in a country that has this culture uh or this anxiety of around accomplishment um and in this season in my life i'm trying very hard um to resist that and, and to kind of center myself back and those things that I love, the same things that I loved as a little girl, the dancing and music and, and writing and, and family. Speaking of music, music has always been a big part of your life. Music has always been a big part of my life. Which explains your very handsome and awesome boyfriend. <laughs> if you don't know John Baptiste, and we're going to bring him in here in just a second, but he's a cool cat, boy. Is he something special? Yeah. I'm sitting smack dab in the middle of a love story. Um, okay, so you're 13 years old. You're both geeks. I know you are at 13 because nobody was not a geek at 13. Oh, yes. So are you guys close to the same age? Yeah, we're about a year and a half apart. A year and a half apart. Mm-hmm. So, uh, John, do you remember uh, your girl from band camp at age 13? <laughs> so here's what I remember. Uh huh. I remember... Birkenstocks. This is not an endorsement. You had Birkenstocks on? Before they were cool. Yeah. <laughs> she was ahead. Suleika <laughs> was ahead. Now, and I also must say, I am, am honored to talk to you because when I was growing up at that time, I was watching you on WWL. Come on. Oh. Come on. <laughs> so when I was growing up in New Orleans, Kenton, Louisiana, uh-huh. you'd be on TV. My first time leaving was to go to this band camp. First time leaving <laughs> home. And being somewhere for the summer, you go somewhere for the summer for the first time. It's like 
a new world. Yeah. Where you, was band camp? Where were you? Saratoga Springs. Oh, so you took a big trip. This yes. was not a nothing. All oh, right. Upstate New York. So you were already, <laughs> what instrument were you playing, John, at the time? Piano. And I saw her in the courtyard. And this is, you know, again, I thought this was maybe a New York thing. People wear Birkenstocks. <laughs> Nobody was wearing that in New Orleans. <laughs> no, they weren't. Those were not cool in New Orleans. And I thought it, it would, what immediately came to my mind was, oh, she's like a, a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like granola. Like <laughs> that vibe. granola. <laughs> Uh, and how did you at 13 were you at what, did you have any confidence level at 13 or were you like a lot of 13 year old girls you did she did definitely I was what? a 13 year old definitely. going on 20 I thought I was far more mature than I actually was that's definitely. impressive most 13 year old girls feel so incredibly awkward I was just coming out of what I call UDS ugly duckling syndrome <laughs> I'd just gotten contacts for the first oh, time to replace my, uh -huh. my bottle Definitely. thick glasses okay so now at 13 that's when the crushes start happening was there a crush or were you all just friends no no, no crush yeah I would I was very much a uh, late bloomer uh -huh. <laughs> so I was into music and video games uh -huh. and martial arts and chess <laughs> things like Eclectic. that. Eclectic. You got a nice array. Uh, all the just, nerdy activities. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say all the introspective kind okay. of uh, introvert activities. Yeah. So you see. So like a, when you saw him, was did you just thought a, a, a nice kid, nice guy? <laughs> I remember thinking he was a little strange because I I think I tried to initiate a conversation and conversation was not happening. You were not into it. You just weren't a conversationalist then. I think. There's a glorious awkwardness <laughs> in uh, coming into your own at that age. Yeah, and it's I think weird. I, it's it's strange, but a beautiful strange. And I feel like I've kept that until adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I still, you know, I feel like we probably tried to speak, and at that time, anybody who I talked to, yeah, and she's always been a great communicator, yeah. always magnetic, always yeah. able to communicate she's got it. the emotions that other people are feeling. I, I noticed that about her immediately. Yeah. Um, but there was no crush. We, we we linked later in college, and that's when we started to really become more friends. You know what's weird? Mm -hmm. I on my first my first week at Juilliard, I was on the one train with my friend Michelle, and I had no you know I hadn't thought about John since band camp several years earlier, which oh, when you're a teenager yeah. feels like yeah. a decade. <laughs> and I see this young man on the train, who is singing to himself and playing the air piano yes, and yes. people were kind of staring because even in New York that's not a sight that you see every day and I looked at him and I turned to my friend and I said that's John Batiste what is he doing here and I said that's the man I'm going to marry someday wait and I just wait, blurted wait, it out wait, and forgot stop about it, it. Stop. I want to stop for a second <laughs> On the one train, you knew you were going to marry John? It, it was like one of those things you just say, and I didn't think about it, and I didn't give it much weight. So is that the last you see of her before you know she's not feeling well? No. Mm -hmm. We we saw each other. This is in college, my yeah. first year, her last year of high school. Then she doesn't end up going to Julia. Right. She goes to Princeton. Then right. At Princeton, she has this... Um, incredible time we don't see each other in passing we see each other at performances here and there right. we have mutual friends but we're not really as connected, connected. yeah then she has a going away party because she's moving you move into paris and i went to the going away party with a mutual friend of ours mm -hmm. but then that was when there was a, a spark at that party the oh. going away party but oh, she was going away. Going to Paris. So bye. That it was not you know oh, the time. You were pining, John, ah. a little, a little. You're pining we a had little. A, a moment. Uh -huh. We had a moment. Well, you got to have a moment. I mean, come on, going to Paris, y'all. There's love in the air. Yes. Okay, so let's fast forward to how did you learn that Suleika was was ill, was not well? So that same friend Michelle told me one day we. Um, were playing, you know, my band, we would play in public places often, mm -hmm. you know, for, not for money, just to bring mm -hmm. the music, revelry, mm -hmm. joy. Uh, we were playing in the subway one mm -hmm. day, and um, mm -hmm. she told me, and I gathered the rest of my band, because at this time it was just a few of us, mm -hmm. and I gathered the rest of them, and we went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I hadn't heard that she was that ill until that moment. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a real moment of... 
clarity that I had to do something. And what I do is music. I just felt I needed to bring that to the situation to help in any way that I could. So that's what I did. But that must have been emotional because you didn't expect to, to see her in that way. I, I, I guess there's an impact that a person has on you that you don't know the full extent of until you're in a moment of mm -hmm. crisis. So it felt like I needed to do something in that moment. Even though we weren't super close friends, it felt like, oh, I really connect with this person. I respect this person, what she's all about, what I know of her. This is this is important. So that's why we went to the, the hospital. We played, and it was a beautiful experience. Did you feel like you were doing some good? Yes. I, I felt like we were doing good, but that's that was a, a special thing for our relationship a special time to to you know you see each other through these different phases and you see what a person is like when they're 13 14 then you see what a person is like at the beginning of college then you see what a person is like when they finish college and going out into the world then you see what a person is like when they're going through tremendous duress the impact of that on their life meeting the family understanding you know how that impacts a whole community. But it's also a testament to John, because John is someone who, who shows up in the difficult moments and who keeps on showing up, not just for me, but for everybody. Mm. Um, and he's always been that way. <laughs> well, I, you, you, you got to show him. <laughs> you got to show people you love them. Mm -hmm. I, I urge everybody out there, you show the person in your life who you haven't told or you haven't shown your love, show them. So what's uh, what's the future with you two? Well, you we were talking about the uh, the kids mm -hmm. you, that 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 you have in your life. That's a beautiful thing to have family. We uh, we look forward to something in that realm. You know, there's complications. Yeah. Um. You know, I don't I, I don't I don't feel like that is ever a barrier to no. family because you, you can you can plenty of ways out. to make mm -hmm. a family, right? Yeah, I, I think it's possible. It's, it's all about love. Well, and I'll just say, like, I think one of my big anxieties coming out of this illness was finding a partner who understood that mm -hmm. and who wasn't sort of scared of having hard conversations or awkward mm -hmm. conversations around things. Um, and I remember talking to John about infertility early on mm -hmm. uh, as a result of my treatment, and he said, there are many ways to make a family mm. and it's its own kind of creative act and you've just been understanding and, and open in a way that I wish were the norm um, wow. but that I feel very grateful for she's got to be real cool. she's a very real person By the way. eloquent <laughs> but she can say <laughs> she's real so you, it's easy to have real authentic conversations well you know I think John is one of the most creatively brilliant people I know, but what I've loved observing and learning from is the way creativity informs every aspect of his life, including our relationship. Mm. And so one example of that is we both travel a lot for work in non-pandemic times, and because of that have to spend sometimes several weeks apart. And he came up with this idea early on in our relationship, which was to write each other a letter mm. every day by hand. Instead of doing like your morning morning pages or writing in a journal, he would write a letter by hand, take a photo of it and text it to me. And I it brought me that. back to those letters <gasps> that I got on the road trip. Oh, wow. And mm. I think that there's sometimes certain things that you can only say in the written word that you don't even maybe know you need to say that come out when you're writing letters. Um, but you're always doing stuff like that. You're always finding creative ways for mm. us to deepen our relationship and to stay connected. By the way, that is the most beautiful and thoughtful and smart. I was thinking, write a letter, but how are you ever going to get it? You take a picture and text it so you can actually read the handwriting. Brilliant. Right? <laughs> Joel and I are stealing that. Thank you. <laughs> I have to tell you, it's so beautiful because watching your story from the beginning unfold, and I've been I've been reading and watching a lot leading up to this interview, and sitting here in this moment and looking at you two is so beautiful. Yeah. 
<laughs> Love is in the air, baby. Aww. Yes. All right, Suleika, John, thank you guys so much. We appreciate you being on Making Space. Thank you.